Good morning and welcome to Thursday morning Zoom. So we're actually going to be doing a lecture on our chapter. And what chapter are we in? I'm already working next week, y'all. You know that. You know I work ahead. So uh, yeah, I'm going to be lecturing chapter three, but we're going to go over the exam before we move on to the, that lecture. You're going to be so excited. It's legal principles. So much fun, right? But <laughs> I didn't pull up all the slides, y'all. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure that everybody knows is the PowerPoints are actually part of your resources. So if you cannot get to your whole chapter or, or you're having timing issues or time management issues, read through your PowerPoint slides. It's the exact same thing that's in your chapter except it's just cut down. Also, if you look at the very back of each chapter, you have a chapter summary that summarizes everything that's in your chapter also. So if you're having a time issue and you can't get to everything and you just want to do like a little skim of your chapter, read that back chapter summary. It's gonna have all your pertinent information in that summary. So that's the first thing. Um, I need everybody to make sure that you review what you haven't finished for this week or what you're going to be finishing maybe this weekend and make sure that you don't have any questions because my phone's going off at five o'clock on Friday and I will not be available until Monday morning. I'm going to take a weekend off, raise all my windows, turn on my 80s rock music and clean the house all weekend. I'm going to move my couch and my bed. And, um, and I'm probably going to be cranky because I haven't done that since last year about this time. So <laughs> y'all know me, I'm a party animal. It's time to fall clean, not spring clean. <laughs> also, if you have not done assignments this week, please get caught up over the weekend. If you have an assignment that you didn't get done and it's closed for this module, if you will go in and put it in your comments, I'll make sure that you get credit for it. So if you missed a question of the day or if you've missed an assignment and it's closed already, like I think it was just one day last week, just go in and put it in your comments and I will make sure that I get it taken care of. So that's all my announcements. Does anybody else have anything? I have made an update to our uh, newsletter, but I will do that next Tuesday. So, but you can see the update if you want to go look at it. But uh, anyway, so there we go. So are we ready for our exciting slideshow on legal principles? Y'all going to feel like you're in civics class. <laughs> One of my kids was watching me make the slides the other day. They were like, we're learning some of that in civics. I'm like, yeah, I know, but laws are important. Oh, what did I do? There we go. So I'm going to share my screen. Come on, move out of our way. <laughs> Chapter three, legal principles. So we have three branches of the US government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. So our legislative, they make laws, executive sign laws, and the judicial decides if the laws are constitutional. Of course, there are several other uh, pieces of information in each one of these sections. I'll let y'all read those. Um, you can go back and do that after I upload. But that was just the basics of information on each of those three branches. The types of laws are constitutional law. That's derived from the federal government and state governments. Then you have your case law is derived from precedents and common law. And then regulatory and administrative law. This concerns procedures, regulations, and rules of federal, state, and local governmental administrative agencies. And statutory law refers to laws enacted by state and federal legislators. Laws can be divided into two main categories. Substantive law, those are laws that determine rights and obligations of people derived from common law and statutes. Then there's procedural law, laws that, are, that all parties must follow when investigating and prosecuting unlawful acts. 
Okay, so this is criminal law. We're going to talk about um, the most serious, which are going to be your felonies. All punishment options are available, which means everything from probation to uh, execution. And then you see execution, prison, probation, and fines. Then you have your less serious, which can be felony and misdemeanors, could be punished as a felony or a misdemeanor, and the discretion is up to the prosecutor or the judge. Your less serious are misdemeanors, which could cause jail, probation, or a fine. And then your least serious are infractions or violations, generally fine only. So if you got a speed temp ticket, that would be an infraction or a violation. I don't know why I thought I needed to add that, but there you go. Let's talk about what is civil law. Civil law is the section of the law that deals with disputes between individuals or organizations. For example, if you're a car crash victim and you claim damages against the driver for loss or injury sustained in the accident, or one company sues another for a trade dispute. There are four branches of civil law. There's tort, contracts, property, and family. We're going to be talking about tort laws uh, because those are really the one, that's the one that really has most to do with the healthcare facility, but it can also be contract law because, you know, we have implied consent and that is a, uh, a type of implied contract, but we're mostly going to talk about tort. So let's talk about intentional torts. Any intentional acts that are reasonably foreseeable to cause harm to an individual and that do so, which can be assault, battery, invasion of privacy, false imprisonment, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and fraud. Which one of these guys think that would be directly related to you as a medical billing and coding specialist or front office or what have you? Invasion of privacy. Could be invasion of privacy. There's another one. Fraud. Fraud. Yep, those are the two that are uh, most commonly... Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. Those are the two that you would most commonly uh, get in trouble for in the healthcare <laughs> realm. And that was not my thought, but we're going to keep moving anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about negligent torts. Okay. You guys see what I have outlined in blue? I have malfeasance, misfeasance, nonfeasance, and malpractice. It is going to be very important for you to know the definition of these for your NCCT exam. So negligent torts, negligent acts can be classified as malfeasance, which is performance of an unlawful or wrongful act. Misfeasance is improper performance of a lawful act. Nonfeasance is the failure to act when one had a legal duty to act. And malpractice is a type of negligence that applies to professionals. You guys have this in your chapter also. So I would definitely um, make notes on these and just study them because I know that malfeasance and misfeasance, they're all very, they're very similar. <clears throat> Negligent torts are more common in healthcare because they are unintentional because they don't think that you're setting out to, uh, you know, break the law. Sometimes it just happens unintentionally. Negligence results when a person's conduct falls below the standard of behavior expected of a reasonable person in, a sa in the same situation. Medical practice occurs, shoot, medical malpractice occurs when a healthcare professional's performance falls below the professional minimum standard of care and thus causes harm to the plaintiff. So the thing that struck me there is the minimum standard. We definitely don't want to be providing minimum standards as healthcare facilities, that's for sure. Okay, let's talk about defenses to liability. There are three main defenses used for lawsuits. There's the technical defense, denial defense, and affirmative defense. And we're gonna watch a little uh, video on affirmative defense. In this video, we will discuss affirmative defenses. An affirmative defense 
is something that the defendant says he will prove to defeat or mitigate the plaintiff's claims. For example, let's say we have Debbie who will be our defendant and Patty who is our plaintiff and Patty and Debbie had a contract. Patty believes that Debbie broke or breached the contract. So Patty alleges in a complaint that Debbie is liable for a breach of contract. And we'll say that in her complaint, one of her allegations is on January 2nd, 2002, Debbie breached the contract. Now let's say that in our jurisdiction, the law is breach of contract cases must be brought within six years of the time of the breach. The legal term for that six year time limit is a statute of limitations. Debbie realizes that the complaint alleges that the breach occurred back in 2002. That means that the statute of limitations expired in January of 2008. The complaint was brought too late. When Debbie answers the complaint, she can include an affirmative defense that the claim must fail because of the statute of limitations. This is the same as Debbie telling the court, I am going to prove that Patty's claim must fail because the statute of limitations expired. If you'd like to discuss defendants' responses in civil litigation or any other matter related to U.S. law, stop by the message. I thought that was a cute little video. But um, affirmative defense, um, contributing negligence, comparative negligence, assumption of risk, limited or no harm, and intervening cause. So it sounds like affirming defense is like um, you're defending yourself and you have concrete evidence. In this video, oh. we will discuss affirmative defense. There we go. All right, so this is where I'm going to need you to make some notes because this is going to be directly related to your assignment that I give you today. So what are the four D's of negligence? Duty of care, healthcare professional has a legal obligation to the patient. Their election, healthcare professional breaches violates the duty of care to the patient, damage, the patient suffers a legally recognized injury, and direct cause, breach of duty of care directly causes the patient's injury. So if you have a phone and you wanna snap a picture of that real quick, or if you need me to let you just take some quick notes, or I am gonna upload this and you can go back to it. So I'm gonna wait just a couple of minutes and then I'm gonna to move to the next slide. Types of damages can be punitive, nominal, compensatory, general, and special. So let's talk now about doctrine of informed consent. So set, there are seven elements that must be present for informed consent to be accurate. The patient or guardian is competent to understand or decide. The patient guardian voluntarily decides to agree or refuse. The patient or the guardian understands diagnosis, reasons for the treatment. Patient guardian understands proposed treatment and the risks of, these, of this treatment. Patient guardian understands alternative treatment and risks of alternative treatments. Patient and guardian understands risks if treatments, treatment is delayed or not done. And the patient or guardian signs treatment consent form. So how do you decide if someone's competent? Is that a decision you make? You can't, the court makes that decision, right? But for example, if say that I have a grandmother and she's 90 and I have 
power of attorney, then I can speak for her. But if my grandmother is 90 and she's of sound mind and I'm just there to offer, she's the one who's, whether we think she's competent or not. Okay, say that a child has Down syndrome and he's 30 years old and he comes in with his mom. Would that patient be competent if he was severely mentally um, inhibited? No, he's not competent because he, ha he actually has something. That, and I hate to say incompetent because I don't believe, but you understand what I mean, making decisions medically. But those are things that are set up from the time that they were small children, that there has to be someone competent. If someone comes in and say it's a small child and the parent comes in and they're severely on drugs, would you consider them competent? No, that's something that you would definitely have to go to the higher ups for and say they're not competent to make this decision at this time. You're also a mandated reporter, right? So you would have to get more involved. You guys are not going to have to worry about all of that, but we're just kind of talking about the comp uh, you know, the, the competencies. Uh, how do you decide who's competent? In most situations, you don't decide. In most situations, you won't have to. And again, I can't really think of a, a time that you would really have to worry about that. I just want you to understand what it means. Hi, Kenyana. All right. So, hey. so we're going to go back to our slides again. Okay, so this is a general procedure consent. And you guys have this in your book. I just put a uh, picture of it here. Do any of you guys recognize a consent form? I've signed quite a few, and you probably signed some for your children, too, <laughs> if you have children. So, um, but yeah, consent forms are pretty generic. Um, they may have a different office on it, but the information is pretty much the same. Now, let's talk about the patient's Bill of Rights. It provides the patients with information on their rights under federal and state laws. The questions need to be answered before decisions are made. You have to respect the patient's decision. You need to show sensitivity, document any refusal in the health record and notify the provider. Now this is a patient's bill of rights and you can't see it really well, but you have a, a copy of this in your book also. Okay, let's talk about if you have an opportunity <clears throat> to work for an oncology office, which I have to tell you, I think would be one of the most difficult places to work. And you're having to uh, have a patient sign a refusal for chemotherapy because they just don't wanna do it anymore. And you're giving the paperwork. Your only job is to show compassion and respect, no judgment. Whether you think it will help or not, your only job is to show compassion. And I know we talk a little bit, a lot about, you know, this is, you cannot show these reactions, but it's only because you never know what you're going to come in contact with. You, you know, we don't know where you're going to go to work. <clears throat> I had no idea I was going to be a cardiology coder, right? So you don't really know what field you're going to be working in, what specialty you're going to be in. So I always want to make you aware that your biggest job is customer service, patient, <laughs> and that means patient service, right? And compassion, you cannot be judgmental. If you don't agree with something or you don't approve, that's your own personal standard. Does not go to your patient. Okay, so let's go back to our... Okay, so this is going to be your assignment today. It's actually critical thinking application 3.6. And it says, Daniela struggles with remembering the four D's of negligence. Be creative. How might a person remember the four D's of ne negligence? Submit this as your assignment. Okay, so what do I mean by that? You can make note cards. Be creative. You know what I mean? It was something fun to help you remember the four D's of neg negligence. So um, just do a little, I'm going to call it a project. Note cards are not necessarily projects, but draw a picture. I don't, you guys understand, you have creative license. 
take a picture of it, do a PowerPoint slide if you want to, but upload it. I'm going to be uploading this video um, under Zoom for today's daily assignment. And that is going to be the assignment that I expect for you guys to submit for me. So that's what you'll be getting graded on. Have y'all noticed I've changed it up a little bit? Do you know why? Making sure that you're making sure that we somebody's watching the videos. Right, because so many times I get questions and I've already answered them. So I want to get everybody to get used to watching. I mean, we're not, I'm not in here just having a party. We're learning stuff, right? And I want everybody to be a part of that. I don't want anybody to miss anything. Okay, so I have one more thing, one more slide. And it's critical thinking application 3.8. Daniela is studying consents. How might you define implied, expressed, and informed consents in your own words? Okay, I'm not asking you to turn anything in with this, but I want you to know the definition of each. This is important information to know. So I want you to take some time and make sure that you know what an implied, expressed, or an informed consent is. Okay, so who wants to review this test? I'm kind of looking at the questions again. You really need to know what confidentiality is. That's very important. So if I asked you, what term means to be free from unwanted intrusion? Confidentiality, precedence, state preemption, or privacy? Can you remember when your parents used to want to intrude into your room to see if it was clean? What would you say? This is against my privacy. So the answer is going to be privacy. Blank is, the, is a legally protected right of patients. Privacy, confidentiality, HIPAA or high tech, tech. Well, first of all, we know it's not HIPAA or high tech. We know it's gonna be privacy or confidentiality. Confidentiality is the legal right. Okay. This is the unique identifier given to all healthcare providers. NPI. What does it stand for? Mm -hmm. National Provider Identifier. Identification or identifier. Or identifi identifier or identification. It, sometimes it's used interchangeably. So this is a number that's given to all healthcare providers. And I don't know if you guys remember on your uh, CMS 1500 form, at the very bottom down there where the, the address goes for the provider and where he signs, it's going to have an NPI number. And um, there's actually a website, and I'd have to go back and find it, where you can actually go to find national provider information. Okay, so you need to know what a covered entity is and what a business associate is. Remember when we went through covered entities? <clears throat> What's an insurance company? Covered entity. What's a clearing house? Do you guys remember now? Covered entity. We've been through those. This HIPAA term means a reason for releasing or disclosing. Sorry, let me start that again. This HIPAA term means a reason for releasing or disclosing, disclosing patient information. De identify limited data set permission or privacy? What do you have to have in order to be HIPAA compliant to disclose patient information? Permission. Permission. I, they're worded funny, guys. I, I know that I, I was realizing later on, I was like, these are really kind of worded funny. So that's when we're kind of going through them. Not all of them. <clears throat> Okay, 
what patient records are held at a higher level of confidentiality? HIV records, drug and alcohol substance abuse, psychotherapy notes, all are correct. All are correct. All of them are correct. That's right. You can put a star by that one because it is on the NCCT. Or every test that I know of, it's been on there. So who are mandatory reporters for child maltreatment? School personnel, social workers, healthcare providers, law enforcement officers are all are correct. Oh. Uh, okay, know what the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act is? And y'all better know this. Kelly, you can't answer this one. This law prohibits intentionally receiving or giving anything of value to get referrals or generate federal health care program business. The Stark Law, the Health Care Fraud Statute, Federal Anti Kickback Law, or Federal Claims Act. Okay, Kelly, you can answer it. Wait, 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 wait. Antoinette wants to answer it. Hang okay. on. The law prohibits intentionally receiving or giving anything of value, gifts, to get referrals or generate federal health care program businesses. Stark Law, the health care fraud statute, federal anti-kickback law, or false claims act. Dark law. Federal anti-kickback law. The anti-kickback. I know those are so close. Kenyana, those are so close. I have to think really, really hard. But anything so like, for example, I'm going to look at this one again. Let's see. The key word here is anything of value. Like if uh, you have uh, season tickets to see the Saints for some money, right? And you go see your doctor and you say, hey, if you'll see me for free for the next year, I'll give you these tickets. That's a value. So that would be the anti-kickback law. Okay, so this was a little misleading because it had the word referrals in it too. And that's where Kenyana thought that the Stark Law, and she was, autumn, she was right on the money with that, except that it was a gift and referrals. So I, I think I, I really applaud y'all on thinking that either are because you have to watch. Now, I want to tell you on the NCCT, they're not that tricky. This one was a little bit tricky. So I do understand. I had to think about that, y'all, whenever I was making this test. I had to really think about that one. I was like, hmm, because it does say both. But because it has uh, the uh, getting any, some things of value, that's why it's the um, anti-kickback. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go through these true false questions because they're a little tricky and they're not my favorite. So I'm going over them with you. <laughs> a stabbing is considered a wound of violence. And in most states, this type of wound needs to be reported. True or true, false? True. It's true. Audits to track user activity are considered administrative safeguard under the security rule. It's false. It's the wording is tricky. A business associate under HIPAA is a person or business that provides a service to a covered entity that involves access to PHI. That is false. The PHI is going to be too much information. The only thing the, uh, the business associate can have is only what's medically necessary, right? Only what needs to be given. The purpose of an incident report is to prevent a future lawsuit. True or false? False. False. Why do you think we, uh, what is an incident report for? 
it's for safety reasons, right? It's to prevent another injury from happen, happening. Um, we had a huge pothole in our parking lot at Unitech in Alexandria. And uh, someone, <laughs> big as daylight, <laughs> had a bright yellow ring around it, talking on the phone and talking to friends and kaput, not me, but a student. So, but we had to do an incident report and then we fixed the hole to prevent further incidents because the neon yellow line wasn't enough because sometimes I don't look where I'm going, right? So the federal anti-kickback law prohibits intentionally receiving or giving anything of value to get referrals or generate federal health uh, healthcare program business. And again, we had referrals, so I, I mean, but the word value is in it again. So which means monetary, which brings us to anti-kickback and that is true. <coughs> I'm expecting to see 100s everybody. <laughs> Julie, what are you shaking your head for? Do I need to go look? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> 